So, I think before that you probably have figured out that you know this is going very methodically, so that you know there is absolutely no ambiguity that we are facing. Okay, so, though there was a vague idea of what work is and you had heard what heat was, okay, we started by saying, uh, we started by first defining what work was and we did not define heat at all. Okay, so, we actually gave a formal definition of what work was, okay, we tried to evaluate work and then we went to the first law, where we again redefined energy, we then we defined heat. Okay, so, it went in a very particular sequence okay, and we never used temperature even at that point and then we went to the 0th law okay, and we decided that there is something called a temperature, but we do not know except that we could label that we did not decide you know how to say whether something is higher or lower. Then there is a science called thermometry where you know you can just put some arbitrary labels based on properties of some substance that you had for example, you could have had the length of a mercury thermometer or the volume in a constant pressure uh, ideal gas thermometer or something like this and you could fix some labels and you come up with some idea of what you know you basically have some basis for putting the labels. The second law in a way is again of course, you know based on observation. So, and maybe you know one of the observations people decided was on this uh, framework where you had arbitrarily decided that something is high or low. Okay, they thought they saw that oh heat or this so called heat is flowing from high temperature to low temperature and you cannot do it the other way around. Okay, but this used a definition of high and low which was based on thermometry and we did not really come up with a solid way to put what is high and low. So, again you will realize that this whole effort is to formalize what is high and low by basing it on a law. Okay. So, that is what the effort of trying to go in this method is that you are trying to come up with a method to formalize what is high and low and in return we will also come with a property called entropy okay. and we will find out why it is useful especially for engineers it is extremely useful. Okay, it decides the limits on processes. Okay. So, just as a background you can uh, I will just write down we first did the first law, it had something to do with what we called as adiabatic work. Okay. We, f we found out you know, you know that you could go that between any two points you could do adiabatic work and it would be in the path would not matter at all. Okay. But the one thing that we never said was is it possible to go from every point A to every point B using adiabatic work. So, for example, if I draw on an arbitrary coordinates some x 1, some x 2 and let us say I am here A. So, first law just tells me yes you know between A and B I can do adiabatic work using any path, maybe it is quasi static, maybe it is non quasi static, I know that W A D does not vary. Okay. But can I really go from A to B using only adiabatic work? That question was never answered. Okay. So, you realize that there is an unanswered question. Okay. Similarly, you can say that people have observed okay, that you have some. So, for example, let us go to the 0th law. Okay. I fix some labels, okay. there is some temperature level which I call A, some temperature level which I call B. I figured out I could differentiate between A and B, but you realize that maybe it is possible that heat gets transferred from A to B, but not the other way around. Okay. So, this is an observation you see, but it is not explained by the 0th law. Okay. So, it just stops at labeling some of the certain things. Similarly, first law stops at you know telling what adiabatic work is, we use it to define heat, we use it to you know uh, come up with a more proper definition of energy, but we never set the limits. Yes, is this possible? Is this not possible? 
if something is possible till what extent is this possible. So, those things are not set up. So, that is why we need the second law which is of course, again based on experience observations and you know it is true as long as you cannot find anything which contradicts it and that is the situation right now. So, I would say over the years there have been various forms in which the second law has been put forth okay? and you probably I, I am not sure you know many of you are explaining the second law in what form you explain it. I mean can I have a listing because mostly in mechanical engineering people I have seen they tend to follow one certain manner. Can I have some examples? What would do you normally say is the statement for the second law? Huh? Kelvin plan. So, I have noticed that yes more or less anyone who comes in mechanical engineering they always seem to know that the second law statement they always have been told is the Kelvin Planck statement. So, that is the one statement we will also go by okay? though of course, you know that there is a statement called the Clausius statement okay? there is statement by Carnot. Okay? There is also a statement by Carey Theodory in fact, that was his statement for the first law was what we followed, but for our proper formulation we will stick with the Kelvin plank because that is in our logical scheme of things to see to it that we are going from one argument to the next in a particular order. Okay. So, we you will realize that just by using the Kelvin plank statement okay, we can arrive logically at many many other conclusions without you know really deviating much from you know some more or less you can say simple logic. Okay. That is why we use the Kelvin plank statement. And while writing down the Kelvin Planck statement, we will also notice why we would rather prefer not to use the Clausius statement, because you know it uses the idea of temperature which we do not want to use as to what is high and what is low. Okay. It uses the idea that there is some something called a high temperature and something called a low temperature. We do not want to use that idea because we still do not know. Okay. So, we would rather stick with something where we do not know what is high and low, but we know what that there is something called a temperature. So, that is all that we really need to use to go ahead. So, that is why we will stick to the Kelvin Planck statement. When we come to the Clausius statement, we can show that this means the other and we will again reiterate that the Clausius statement is you know slightly weaker. Okay. So, the Kelvin Planck statement I think most of you know is uh, it says that in some vague way it says that there is no possible process which can just take Q from a particular heat reservoir and you know convert it entirely into heat. So, for example, so basically this all deals with let us say some cyclic device okay, so which executes a cycle. So, by itself it is not really changing its energy. Okay. So, it takes Q from some heat reservoir which set let us say some temperature T 1. So, this is the label we are giving. We do not know what that label is, but we know that you know yes it has a particular temperature and that is good enough for us. Since this cyclic device you know it is undergoing a cycle okay, it is not changing its state. So, for it this delta E is 0. So, this Q is equal to W. So, this we know or this what the, the Kelvin Planck statement says that this is not possible. Is that I think this is the accepted statement. So, of course, there are two three small new concepts there is something called a temperature reservoir. What is a temperature reservoir? I mean it correct. So, it is again one of those idealized concepts that no matter how much energy you take out of it the temperature of it does not change. I mean you can say it is some kind of even temperature reservoir is a relative concept you can say you know for example, if you are a mosquito and you fall in a swimming pool the swimming pool is a temperature reservoir for you because the mosquitoes energy does not affect 
the swimming pool energy. Okay, but if two three of you fall, maybe it affects. Okay, your temperature and that temperature may change. So, in a way, it is a relative concept, but for we can say it is the temperature reservoir for our engine is what we are looking for. So, the T you know does not change. Okay. Then we come to something which is called a heat engine, because we were talking of a device which converts Q to W. Okay. So, there is a device called as a heat engine. So, the engine is a device which you know probably interacts with a few temperature reservoirs. Okay. There is a Q transfer and it itself is a cyclic device. So, it is just taking Q and all it does is you know converting into W. Okay. Nowhere are we saying that it is only taking Q, it is interacting with some few a few reservoirs. There is a Q interaction between this engine and those reservoirs and Q comes out. So, the heat engine is something which you can say interacts with temperature reservoirs okay, and outputs work. It is a cyclic device. Which one? Which one? Here. So, because it is a reservoir whose temperature does not change, that is what we are looking for. So, all our argument for second law is based on temperature reservoirs, where we say that something is interacting with a temperature reservoir, something whose temperature does not change. Which one? Yes. No, no, no. The temperature reservoir is correct because that is the quantity which we are assuming is not changing. See, you are removing energy. There is no doubt that if you remove energy, you expect the T also to change. Okay, but that's why I said it's a relative concept. It's so huge compared to your engine. Okay, that however much energy you remove, we assume the temperature doesn't change too much, or it more or less remains constant. And that is the argument we need here because we will talk about interactions with temperature reservoirs as far as our second law goes. Actually, we are taking only energy, not a temperature. Correct. You are taking only energy, you are not taking temperature. So, it continuously supply energy, that is why it must be called a energy reservoir. <laughs> no, no, no. I, but see, we are saying it has a continuous or it has the same temperature irrespective of you know how much energy you remove. So, because we want, because we will talk of more than one energy reservoirs if you want to say that. I want to put two different labels to it. Okay. One has a particular temperature, the other has a particular temperature. Now, if I start calling them energy reservoirs, I mean that is ok, but you know I really want to put a label to them. So, I will say this reservoir has a temperature T 1 and this reservoir has a temperature T 2. Okay. So, I would prefer to call it a temperature reservoir, okay. mm -hmm. but you are right. I mean if you want you can call it energy reservoir, but the label is the T 1 or T 2 or whatever else that I have put on it. That is all that we are trying to distinguish. Sir, we can say, we can say that the energy reservoirs are part of energy reservoirs. No, I mean I would not say that. Why, why are you trying to say that? Yes, okay. Professor Gaitonde has comment. I think we should not get carried away by the nomenclature. Yes. The nomenclatures used are temperature reservoir, uh, energy reservoir, constant temperature energy reservoir, thermal reservoirs and anything. The idea is it is a system whose large enough compared to what we are doing, so that in a few cycles which we will be using for analysis, it temperature does not change. And this is a realizable approximation, either we have what we call later you know large thermal inertia. Okay, so, that uh, with a finite amount of energy extraction, the temperature changes little if at all or we can have what we saw yesterday that is a or uh, based on steam tables a constant pressure thing with uh, wet steam in it. 
<laughs> so long as you maintain the pressure constant, the temperature will remain constant and so long as you do not extract such a large amount of heat that everything condenses or supply such a large amount of heat that everything evaporates, it will maintain its temperature. So, it is easily realizable. Okay. Let us not get carried away by the nomenclature. If you are comfortable with some other nomenclature, use it. Later on by Friday, we will decide what the nomenclature to use in the final course. So, I think that should satisfy all. Okay. So, since I will continue to call it temperature reservoir. So, what we are saying or we would rather have the Kelvin Planck statement as such. So, this cyclic device is the heat engine. Okay. So, I can reword the Kelvin Planck statement and say that a 1 T heat engine does not exist. Okay. So, which means some heat engine which is interacting with only one temperature reservoir okay, taking having a Q interaction and outputting W such a heat engine cannot exist. So, that is that is how we are you know shortening the entire Kelvin Planck statement and you know making use of the word heat engine which you know as mechanical engineers we would like to use it. Okay. That is so this is our preferred way of putting the Kelvin Planck statement that a 1 T heat engine does not exist. Okay. So, that means you need more than one temperature reservoir with which the heat engine will interact. Okay. So, a 2 T heat engine, a 3 T heat engine these are all fine. Okay. So, that is what we would want to go ahead. So, how would a 2 T heat engine look like? So, I have just drawn a 2 T heat engine. So, there are two temperature reservoirs, one is at T 1, one is at T 2. Okay. And this heat engine, this is the heat engine, this is the cyclic device in middle that I am drawing. This heat engine is interacting with one temperature reservoir, you know there is a Q interaction which I am calling Q 1 and it is interacting with you know the other temperature reservoir which I have labeled as T 2. Okay, there is a Q interaction okay. and I am calling it Q 2. Right now, I have assumed that you know Q 1 is being absorbed and Q 2 is being rejected and that is why I have put a minus sign and W will naturally by first law come out to be Q 1 minus Q 2. Okay. So, this we are saying is possible. Okay, is possible. I mean, it is possible that this such an engine can exist. Okay. But now, we want to argue out our next argument that if this is possible, we never said anything about where it should absorb heat from and where it should reject heat from. So, is it possible for it to do this? I should put some Q 1 dash, some Q 2 dash, some W dash. Is it possible for the same engine to run between the same two temperature reservoirs, but now absorb heat from the one labeled T 2 and give it to the one labeled T 1, given that the first one was possible? Or if this is possible, is it possible to do the other way around? Correct. So, the so, you will the argument we will put forth okay, is that whatever we do, okay, we will first see whether it will violate the Kelvin Planck statement or not. Okay. If it does, then we say this is possible or not possible. Okay. 
So, you will realize that for us for every argument to be true we will test it with the Kelvin blank statement. Okay. If it satisfies the Kelvin blank statement we will say okay, this is probably possible. If it does not satisfy the Kelvin blank statement we hold the Kelvin blank statement to be supreme and we say you know if it violates such a thing is not possible. So, for example, if I have such a process let us say this is possible. Okay. This q 1 values q 2 values are different, okay. but you know I can since this is a cyclic device let us say you know I run it some n times okay, and I run this m times I will run it in such a way that you know m times q 1 dash is n times q 2 and I will put this together this is like a black box for me. So, when I have done this you realize that I have removed from T 2 as much energy that I had put in it using this device I have removed from it. Okay. You will realize that these things you will have an interaction only here. This combined device has an interaction only with T 1 okay, and it is outputting net energy out. So, what we realize is that if one of these is possible, okay, the other is not possible. So, if, if the right side was possible, then the left side is not possible or if you find out that the left side was possible, then you will realize that the right side was not possible. So, it is only one of the two situations which can be possible, both cannot be possible. Okay, because if both are possible, you can create a 1D heating. That is going to be the argument. The same thing can be said, you know, I will not state the Clausius statement, but I will just say the same thing. Let us say that there was a heat engine where this was possible. Between some temperature reservoirs with labels T1 and T2, I could have done this heat interaction. Okay. Then I consider two situations. Now, I have the two temperature reservoirs, okay. I mean I have just drawn this line q either you know you can say directly they are in contact or maybe there is a cyclic device in between whose only duty is to take q from T 1 and put it in T 2 or it is a device which just takes q from T 2 and put it. So, by itself it is not changing its state in one cycle it just picks up some q from one reservoir and puts it in the other reservoir both the reservoirs have different temperatures, okay. they are not the same temperature. So, now you will realize that if this was possible, you will realize that you would not mind this happening. If I combine this and this, okay, from T 2 in one case you are putting Q, here you are taking out Q okay, and you know I can always this is a cyclic device, I can always run the number of cycles in such a way that the q's match and you will realize that I can have a net effect where I am not at all the q here, I will just balance it out and there is no net q interaction with T 2 and the combination will just ensure that there is an interaction with T 1 and some net output of work done. So, that means I realize that if this is possible. I have no problems with this, but I have problems with this. This I will say is not possible. Okay. I have not used the Clausius statement of high and low. I have just used the Kelvin plank to say if something was possible between two temperature reservoirs, there is a Q transfer possible without anything else, without any external work, without anything else between T 1 and T 2, but not the other way around. Okay. Why? The argument is the same. If I combine, can I will I violate the Kelvin Planck statement or not? Kelvin Planck statement said nothing about you know what is high and what is low, it just talked about 1 T heat engines. It says a 1 T heat engine cannot exist. So, I am just showing whether it can exist or not. So, that is the logical argument. Is that is that okay? So, 
we started with with just one statement saying that you know this is not possible okay so we are just trying to see if you know that statement is getting violated and every time we think it is violated we say yes okay whatever we had assumed then that is not possible because we believe that the kelvin planck statement is completely true okay if that is true then something which violates it that is not possible so that is how our argument will go on now so i have i have still not i mean you you realize that this is some form of the clausius statement that i have put here but i have not used high and low because the clausius statement explicitly uses high and low so i i am not going to use that right now so i can think of now let us say you know some heat engine which is working between t1 and t2 okay i can think of another engine which i realize i can set it between so let me call this q1 q2 q2 dash q3 dash w2 dash w so though between t2 and t1 i cannot have a process where i remove some q from t2 extract work and you know put the remaining in t1 i can probably find a reservoir where i can remove q from t2 extract work and dump some amount of q in t3 it is always possible of course you will realize that i can have an argument if that this if this independently exists this one then you know i cannot have something reverse you know going that you can take you know, it is the same argument i have used that argument earlier that if one direction is possible the other direction is not possible just because i will violate the kelvin axiom okay so uh, right now i leave you with this statement because i need to go so um let me save this so we had you know just decided that if you can run an engine between t1 and t2 in this fashion okay you can't run it the reverse way because every time our only logic was are we violating kelvin planck statement or not if yes then we say okay our assumption is wrong so if this is possible the reverse was not possible so then we said is it possible now to probably run an engine between t2 and some other t3 so it is possible probably i mean we'll have to test it out probably it is possible now if it is possible to run the engine between t2 and t3 such that you absorb q2 from t2 reject to q t3 and have some work output w2 dash okay then we know for sure that we can't do the reverse that is we can't go from t3 to t2 because we will use the same argument if we do it we will violate kelvin plan so then we can ask the question is it possible to run an engine between t1 and t3 in this way some q1 double dash q3 double dash w3 i will put double dash is it possible to do this your argument will be yes because always this is some cyclic device this is some cyclic device i can always run the this cyclic device and this cyclic device such that these two are equal that is i put in so much q2 as much as is removed here okay so that means the net interaction with t2 is zero and this total this total combination is only absorbing from t1 only rejecting to t3 and there is a net work output which is coming from here and here 
Okay. So, what I have done is a combination and try to give you an engine which I mean the net device is just running between T 1 and T 3 as far as you know the external world is concerned. Okay. So, that means if it was possible to run an engine between T 2 and T 3 in this fashion definitely it was possible to run an engine between T 1 and T 3. You can now make an argument can I run the engine between T 3 and T 1 in the opposite way you will say again no because I have already used that argument for T 1 and T 2. Once you can run an engine between one temperature label and another temperature label I cannot run it in the reverse fashion because I will violate the Kelvin blank state. Okay. So, that means I have come to a conclusion that I can now draw another T 4 here and maybe I can run another engine between T 0 and T 1 and I can keep this going on. So, I will have a set of levels. Okay. I can use the same argument with let us say purely the heat transfer that is there is a level here, there is a level here T 1 and T 2. It is possible to go directly like this, it is possible to go directly like this. It is then definitely it is possible to go directly like this. Same argument, if it is possible to go directly like this, I know that if this was possible, sorry, I know that if this was possible T 1 and T 2, this is possible. I know between T 2 and T 3 if it was possible to run an engine T 2 and T 3. Then between T 2 and T 3 a direct heat transfer was possible, I do not violate anything. Then I know that T 3 to T 2 directly heat transfer is not possible because I already used that argument earlier that if I run an engine between T 1 and T 2, then this is possible but this is not possible. This is not possible, this is possible correct. So, I can use the same argument between T 2 and T 3 for an engine. If the engine works in this way, then this is possible. If the engine works between T 1 and T 3 here, then definitely this is also possible because I will use the same argument again and I will know that the reverse is not possible. So, we see that definitely yes we are creating a hierarchy now that is from one temperature to another temperature if an engine is you know you can run the engine such that there is a work output the reverse is not possible. From the so called you know the temperature from where you cannot run the engine you can always find another temperature between which you can again run the engine okay. and if you can run let us say between T 2 and T 3 it is we have already shown that you can definitely run it between T 1 and T 3. Okay. So, we are creating an, a hierarchy T 1, T 2, T 3, T 4 etcetera etcetera down. So, now you see where this is leading to. So, it is as if saying that you know this guy is the bigger guy or the bigger person, this is the next person in the hierarchy, this is the next person in the hierarchy and so on. Okay. Because it is as if you know he says this person says I can run an engine by rejecting heat to you, this person says I can run an engine by rejecting heat to you. The definitely the upper person can definitely run an engine by rejecting heat to the next lower guy. So, it is a you know whoever T 2 can run an engine with T 1 can definitely run it. So, T 2 is T 1 is higher than anyone T 2 is higher than. Okay. So, then we say okay, we are already using this logic that you know there is some kind of a hierarchy. So, this is where we now decide to say this is high and this is low. So, this, this brings us to our next step that we say that if I can run an engine between T 1 and T 2 such that I can absorb heat from T 1, produce work and reject heat to T 2, I will define this as being T 1 higher than T 2. So, this is my logic for saying what is high and what is low. Okay. So, I am not going to use thermometry, I am going to use the Kelvin Planck statement to decide what is high and what is low. 
I know for sure now that I cannot run the engine the opposite way, I can run it in only one direction and this is what I call high and low. And now you will realize that this definitely corresponds with the Clausius statement because in the Clausius statement you can have a device which does nothing else but transfer a quantity of heat Q from so called higher temperature to so called lower temperature, correct? And we are saying yes, this is possible and the Clausius statement says you cannot do it from a so called lower temperature to a higher temperature and we are saying yes, you cannot just take heat from a lower temperature using a cyclic device and the net result is just dumping the entire heat into a higher temperature. The Clausius statement used high and low, we never used it till now. We only first said that we use the Kelvin plank, decided what is high and low based on the Kelvin plank and we said yes, this exactly corresponds to our logic for the Clausius statement. That is once we have decided what is high and low, we say yes, the Clausius statement applies because if this is the direction in which I take Q, get W and reject Q2 out, then this way is not possible and this is nothing but the Clausius statement. Is this, is this okay? okay. So, we have deliberately tried not to use the Clausius statement because it assumed something was high and low. Okay. We did not want to get into that argument because we just went by the laws. We said the zeroth law only you know decided stopped at labeling things, it did not decide what is high and low. So, we use the Kelvin plank to decide what is high and low. Okay. And then we said yes, now the Clausius statement sounds reasonable, okay. but that is why we never went and tried to use the Clausius statement. If you already knew what was Clausius statement and if you said yes, this is how the law should be, you can always try to derive it the other way around, okay. but we felt that the Kelvin plank is the strongest statement okay, and we can base our entire logic only on this. So, I think if you go by this logic, people will hopefully you know understand yes. you know. You have not used any other argument except saying that we believe in the truth of the Kelvin plan. Is this okay as you know trying to build up the hierarchy of temperature deciding what is high and low. So, we have again you know we have only decided what is high and low, we have not numbered anything, we have not said that I know that this temperature is something and this temperature is something, we have only decided this is high and this is low. Okay. Is this, if this is fine then you know let me come to some definitions. Okay. If there is an engine then the efficiency of the heat engine I can always say is the net work output upon how much heat it absorbs. This is the traditional definition that people have used for an engine because the ultimate aim of the engine is to extract work okay, and what we provide is the input. So, you know it is one of the normal ways to define an efficiency what you get out upon what you put in in some sort of way. So, this is if we stick with this definition this is of course, W can be written as Q 1 minus Q 2 because that is arising from the first law you know we are not using any other magic there okay. and this can be written finally as 1 minus q2 by q1 so this will be true for any heat engine 1 minus q2 by q1 that is the going to be the efficiency of a heat engine there is also something called a refrigerator you know which is just something which is the other way around you take some q2 from a t2 you put in some work W and you dump a Q1 in T1. Okay, so, this is perfectly possible by the Clausius statement that you can take heat from a so called lower temperature and dump it into a higher temperature reservoir if you are actually inputting work. Okay, so, there is something external that is happening. Okay, so, it is the only the sole thing is not just taking Q2 and dumping Q2 in a higher reservoir, but there is also a W. So, this is allowed. So, this thing is what is called as a refrigerator 
okay so i mean you know it but i guess this is the time when you are going to introduce it to the students okay what is the concept of a refrigerator that you are trying to keep a low temperature region cool okay and that is the objective of running a refrigerator and in refrigerator we don't define an efficiency i guess the only logic here is because you know the numbers will turn out to be more than one what we get is actually we want what we want really is to remove q2 so we would want to put that on the top in any definition of some measure of performance and what we put in is the work okay so you know you can have it greater than 1 so you are not really going to call it an efficiency typically you say we call it as a coefficient of performance okay i mean it's just it's just something that we are okay with you know by calling it a coefficient of performance so once you come to this definition okay we will now come to what is called as the you know carnot theorem for the second law we will figure out so this is another statement for the second law so you have to just show how each statement is true and for every statement you have to again go back to the kelvin plank that will be always your logic 